All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas. This is the uh, track, is it? Yeah, Ground Truth track. <laughs> um, today we have Son Il Yu, uh, and he's going to be giving a presentation, Double Entry Accounting Systems for Security. Um, just a quick, couple quick announcements before we begin. I would like to thank our sponsors, our diamond sponsor, Adobe, and some of our gold sponsors, Prisma Cloud, Sem, uh, Semgrep, and Blue Cat. Uh, for cell phones, if you guys could please put them in a silent mode uh, for the duration of the uh, presentation. And at the end, if you have any questions, uh, if we have time, I will be walking around with a hand mic. So just raise your hand kindly. And if we don't, uh, and we do run out of time, uh, you can just pull the speaker off to the side and ask questions there. So uh, without further ado, Mr. Yu. Thanks very much. Right. I'm going to hold this. Can I hold this? No. All right. Maybe not. I didn't realize uh, Palo Alto went by Prisma Cloud now. That, that's their name. Anyway, OK. So thanks for coming. Um, I'm Sunny Yu, And um, I don't know if you had a chance to see the keynote, but I did make a quick reference to this in the keynote. It's all around how do we um, start applying certain practices that we know in accounting towards uh, security, right? And so let me, uh, if you don't know what double entry accounting is, I want to give a quick definition. Um, it's a summarized version of what you can just find in Wikipedia, okay? Uh, so uh, so for some, some history, back in 1458, um, the uh, Medicis, I think, or anyway, some Italian guys uh, figured out how to do double entry accounting. Before that, it was single entry accounting. Makes sense, right? And the basic idea is you have these two ledgers. Uh, so you have a cash ledger and you have, a let's say, a different ledger. And they are supposed to balance out, OK? But it's just two separate ledgers that help uh, provide a set of, certain set of benefits. And so I'm, let me read those benefits. And you can see where it might apply. So it offers an accurate and reliable comprehensive view of our transactions. It minimizes errors, uh, basically leading to more trustworthy reporting, and facilitates easier compliance and auditing. Sound familiar? That sounds like something we, we, we want in security? I, I hope so, right? So these fundamental principles that we look for in security, well, gee, uh, in accounting, we have, those, uh, we have something like that already in place. So the question is, where do we have the opportunity to see double entry accounting uh, type of uh, functions happening in security? You just don't recognize it for what it is. But once you recognize it, you're like, ah, this is it. How do, we, how do we make more of those type of systems? How do we uh, ensure those systems can be uh, reinforced and so on and so forth? So now, now, as I talk about this, I have to set some foundational uh, principles. You know, I have, that's how I think. I, I think in principles, because if, if, you don't, if you disagree with what I'm saying in my conclusions of the principles, uh, then you, you can disagree. Well, you could disagree with me on those, but let's go, I would rather go to first principles and say, do you disagree with the first principles? That's why I share frameworks all the time, OK? So uh, one of the things that we oftentimes hear from many vendors is, hey, this is your single source of truth. Okay? And that's a myth. I think we all recognize that to be a myth, because the reality is that there isn't a single product that tells us the whole, uh, the whole truth. right? And I think we intuitively know that. But let me dissect those words for a moment. What do we mean by whole truth? Okay? Now, you may have heard the word whole truth um, before in a slightly separate context, which is in sworn testimony. Right? So the question is, what is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And can we actually handle that? Right? So what is the truth? Okay. And then the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Well, let's, let's talk through those because those are, uh, you may wonder, like, why do we repeat those three things in sworn testimony? They must be different because otherwise it seems kind of redundant. Right? Okay. So what's the truth? Well, that's pretty easy. Right? Uh, truth is just, don't lie. Um, don't alter anything in response to a question. So an example in security would be, or just in IT in general, is, hey, tell me the encryption status of this um, widget here. And I, if I get an answer back that says it's disabled, so if I ask a witness and the witness is some tool and the, witness, uh, the tool says, hey, it's off, OK, then I need some sort of cross-examination perhaps with a different system or something else that says, no, no, it's actually, it's actually turned on. Maybe I go to the actual system or something like that, OK? So this is an example of um, where I'm not telling the truth. And you know, it's easy to verify. You just go and look for it, and voila, uh, voila, right? Then you have the whole truth. So the truth, the whole truth. And the whole truth is about not omitting uh, key information. 
And this is actually a lot harder. Okay, how do you know you're missing the whole truth? So I can ask a question. Hey, um, do I have any security groups that uh, al allow inbound access? And I can have a rule that says, nope, I have no security groups. That So I, I may have an alert asking for the whole truth. I'm expecting the whole truth. And the alert is, is, is to say, hey, do I see this? Uh, another example beyond what you see here is, um, what you see with a lot of MITRE attack uh, claims, okay? Hey, we see this TTP. Um, well, you see a very specific form of a TTP, but do you see all aspects of the TTP? And of course, the answer is no, right? Um, and that's an example, again, of a place where you have uh, missing whole truth. And so uh, how you understand the actual truth here is really hard. And I'm going to talk about this in greater detail. Uh, but the whole idea of the uh, whole truth is, well, I asked about security groups, and, I, and my answer was no, I don't have any Azure security groups, but, well, I might have some AWS ones, right? So I'm not getting the whole truth here. And that's one of the problems that we have in our security tooling. All right, so I'm going to come back to that in a moment, but uh, the last form of sworn testimony, or the last aspect of sworn testimony is nothing but the truth. So. Uh, I, I was trying to think of some good examples for this one, and I, I like making fun of the security vendor industry. So the one I, I figured was, okay, hey, how secure are you, uh, vendor, security vendor in particular? And the answer is, hey, look at all the certifications that we have and all these awards that we won, and somehow that's supposed to <laughs> tell me that they're secure or that they're a great vendor. Um, and upon cross-examination, we realized uh, they failed their ISO 27001, and they just basically paid for those, those awards. Uh, by the way, I should mention, not all those awards are truly play to play, um, but I, I didn't t spend time to figure out which ones were which. But the point is that um, nothing but the truth is an example of something like this. All right. So, okay. So you understand now what, what is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Um, and when it comes to, as I mentioned, the truth, it's easy to validate. You have the truth, or you can, ch you can check against the truth, and it, you know it's false, you know it's not right. You can also validate and cross-examine this. But the problem with the whole truth is you don't really have a main means to understand the full scope of what is the whole truth, okay? And so this is a, this is a hard problem. Um, and I thought about this, and I said, huh, could double-entry accounting help us understand the existence of the absence of whole truth, <laughs> okay? It, the existence of the absence of whole truth, all right? Uh, it's a mangled phrase, but bear with me. Um, what I want to know is, am I missing the whole truth? I may not know what the whole truth is, but I at least want to know that I'm missing the whole truth. How would you know you're missing the whole truth? You wouldn't know because you don't have a means by uh, which you do that. But double entry accounting allows us to do that. We would say, hey, I have this one ledger that says I just incremented something by $1,000, but this other ledger, there's a mismatch here. I'm missing something. Okay, I don't know what that is, but now I investigate. All right, so let's, let's talk about that and see what that looks like. So again, cyber defense matrix for those who don't know, uh, something I created when I was at Bank of America, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but uh, the more interesting aspect of it is that I can split up the, I can, I can, I can look at this as a ledger, as two types of ledgers, okay? One side of the ledger is on the left of Boom, and it's what I call structural awareness. Tell me the state of the environment. This is all before anything happens. This is like your inventories, this is your uh, CMDBs. Um, if you have a vulnerability word listing, that's where this is. This is your tax surface. And this is everything on the state side of the equation. This is the state side of the ledger. Then you have the other side, the right of boom side, and this is uh, what we call situational awareness, or what I'm going to call situational awareness. This is after something bad has happened. These are your events. These are your logs, uh, all those sort of things. Um, uh, these are where your compromised systems live, and so on and so on. And so you have ledger one, and you have ledger two. And they're two completely separate systems, which is what you want for a double entry accounting system. You don't want them to be if they were the same system, then it's essentially a single entry accounting system. But these are two separate types of systems. And what's really kind of cool is that they provide quality control for each other. Okay? So let me explain how that works. So let's take, I'll, I'll explain this a uh, ledger one system, a structural awareness system. This is, again, like a CMDB or something that gives you, again, what I call structural awareness, your state of your environment. So let's say you had some, uh, some widget, some switch, and at T1, it's on. 
And at some point, when you pull again, it's off. OK? So you're maintaining state. First, you know that switch A exists. And now you know the state of the switch. And at some point between T1 and T2, someone, something happened okay, but in this polling cycle. And so now the natural question is, hey, other ledger, do you, did you see that activity? Okay? Did you log that? Because now, if I did, I'm like, OK, good. I, um, I at least am collecting, um, I have a log that observes that activity. However, the, if the answer is no, then I know I'm missing something. Okay, now the answer may be, uh, there's many different reasons why the answer may be no, but now you have a choice. Do I want to spend time and effort to investigate uh, this side of the ledger that is missing the whole truth? Okay, and the answer may be, I don't care. Um, and, and by the way, in accounting, that's oftentimes the answer too. Like, you know what, this is a, um, uh, uh, some, um, uh, what's, the, what's the kind of fund that's like really small dollar amounts? Um, petty cash, petty cash. Petty cash. Yeah, it's petty cash fund, okay? And you know what, do I, do I need to have a precise accounting of every penny that's spent there? It's, there's a reason why it's called petty cash, right? Um, it, and so in that, in that sort of sense, I may not choose to investigate because it's petty cash. Uh, but in other cases, well, I, that, that's the equivalent of saying, you know what, I don't know what's happening in my guest Wi-Fi network, but I don't really care. Okay? But if it's in my DMZ, I care a lot. And so this whole notion of um, knowing when you have a state change, you can reconstruct events from state changes. right? Not really well, but nonetheless, there's a mechanism for that. And conversely, on the other end, so you have somebody switching, um, flipping a switch, and you do the same thing. You say basically, okay, I see that uh, switch B is off, or I did something to uh, flip switch B. State system, other ledger, did you, do you have, do you know about switch B? Is that even in your inventory? And if the answer is no, again, uh, it's what I'm calling visibility here. I'm missing visibility. That means I may choose to go get additional sensors to see that switch B. Uh, but again, I may also say I don't care. All right? But nonetheless, I have a perspective of the existence of the whole truth. I may not know that, I still don't know the whole truth, but I know that the, I'm missing the whole truth. Okay? And herein, you have this ledger system, which we already have these kind of tools in place, but we haven't figured out how to balance the ledgers together. And so that's the idea, the, the, or at least not more than the idea. That's, that's actually what I'm doing. And I'm starting to see vendors actually bring these two systems together. Um, and it's actually pretty cool, because now you're bringing two different systems. But at the same time, you, don't want them, you still want them to operate somewhat independently, because you need those sort of checks and controls. Um, and ultimately, the goal here is, uh, well, so what, what I've seen with a lot of uh, uh, attempts here is, those who try to take uh, event-based systems and reconstruct state from there, okay? And if anyone's tried to do that, it's hard, and it's painful, and it's highly inefficient, okay? So any reconstruction of state to events and, and from event to states, state um, is going to be incomplete um, and less efficient because you're, you're, the way that it works is uh, you have to, like if, I, if I'm going to recreate events from state, well, one of the problems is if I don't have the right polling cycle, I'm going to miss the event, right? So am I going to increase the polling cycle so that's every one second? No, it's just, it's not going to be, uh, it's, it's not reasonable for you to do that. So it will be incomplete. You're not going to have every instance of every state change. But nonetheless, with a sufficient number, uh, with, with a decent polling cycle, and over time, you will see those state changes and you'll say, okay, uh, I'm not missing the whole truth. Uh, oh, here, again, the goal here is not to have the whole truth all the time. It's just to know when you're missing the whole truth. And then likewise, with events to state, well, if there's, if there's no state change, then you never know about the, the uh, resource itself. And so, um, again, that's why it's going to be incomplete. But also, uh, any sort of event-based system uh, struggles in maintaining state. And so that's, that's the other challenge that if you've ever tried to do this, it's hard. Um, so my, my advice to you is, if you, ever, if you want to create this subway tree accounting system, which allows you to basically know when you're missing the whole truth, um, use it for the purposes of that balancing equation, but not, for, not to replace the other side. Okay. Now, there, there are a number of implications as, uh, that come as a result of this. Um, first is this perspective of, 
what is, uh, so I mentioned uh, the quick keynote, some of these things that we're trying to do um, may put additional burden on us, actually, okay, because we're now moving into a space where um, there are standardized practices that look like accounting, and if you're moving at that sort of space, then there's an expectation that you're pr practicing, um, you know, those generally accepted practices as well. So now the question is like, well, you know what, I, I don't want to set a bar that's higher than what's in accounting. But think about accounting. How long has it been around? You, you saw the, you know, the, uh, the uh, double entry accounting thing. It was, this was 1458, okay? Uh, and of course, accounting existed before then too. Um, it's a very mature practice. It, it's, people care about it a lot because it's all about money, right? And yet, if you ask a CFO and ask them, hey, you know what, how, I, like, how precise is your accounting? Do you have any, like how, are, how comfortable, what level of variance are you comfortable with? And they'll tell you, oh, you know, it's okay. As long as we dock the boat within 1%, we're good, okay? <laughs> um, we're 1% would be great in cybersecurity. Uh, I think we're oftentimes asked for like 0%, okay? Like no mistakes, no anything, right? Like uh, how realistic is that for us if finance, which is a much more mature uh, um, practice with many more tools and many more processes can't even get to zero themselves. So what sort of, why are we setting a bar that's higher than them um, for ourselves or for our external regulators? And then uh, there, now for many organizations, they actually still practice single entry accounting when they're small and they don't need to, uh, there's like a whole cash accrual system and there, there's a bunch of things that, I'm not in finance or uh, accounting. Those who've ever studied it, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. But there is a, there is a point where you switch. You say, you know what, we need to have more rigor here. Um, and so I don't, I'm not suggesting double entry accounting is, a per, is perfect for everyone. In fact, uh, it's not, double entry accounting and accounting is not perfect for every organization either. So at the right time, you switch and you say, okay, you know, we need more rigor here. Um, th there's an expectation of more rigor. When is that for cybersecurity? as well, because we can do this. We can actually do double entry accounting, but it's, it's gonna take a little effort. Well, partly because sometimes you don't even have a CMDB. Huh. You don't have a SIM. You don't have something that captures that. Uh, you don't have the other side of the ledger. Um, but once you do, now you have the ability to now do this double entry accounting. Okay, and then uh, I, I just leave it with this question of, do we wanna have something like Sarbanes-Oxley for security? Because it comes with uh, penalties if you don't do it right. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, um, we're already getting penalized uh, with lawsuits and SEC fines and, and in some cases criminal prosecution because we don't have these practices well understood. All right, um, now this is just one example of accounting uh, an accounting principle. I, you, you saw me talk, I, you may have heard me talk about impairment and other sort of practices. There's other uh, systems that we've seen that may seem like double entry accounting but actually end up being more single entry accounting. Those are uh, just where it goes back to the truth question. In other words, you say, hey, someone, some, something is saying um, we are compliant in this way here, and I just need to verify that that compliance is happening. That's not double entry accounting. That's just a, tell me the truth, I'm confirming and doing cross-examination uh, cross of the truth. Um, pretty straightforward. But I think the whole truth, again, is a really hard problem because you don't know if you ever know the whole truth, but double entry accounting helps us do that. So, okay, with that, questions? Go ahead. I like this, obviously. Oh. Um, thank you. I love applying other business concepts to security. That makes perfect sense, right? Because we're not doing anything new. So taking legal concepts, whole truth, and how you respond, and is that fully the correct answer or intentionally vague, right? Um, and using double entry accounting. The other thing, however, that other business practices use, and maybe this is in addition to your first principles list in this concept, is the notion of forecasting. Hmm. So in finance, we use forecasts as another check. This is what we were expecting to occur in this period. And then we have accurate, you know, um, the actual numbers coming at the end of the month. And we look at the difference between forecast to budget, which is actually even further. So we, we planned in January. So now we have forecast to budget, forecast to actuals, and we can carry that forward month over month as the year progresses now. Very different, of course, than in security. But perhaps as a first principle, the, I guess my question is, 
are you introducing the concept of applying other methods or yeah. are you suggesting this one specifically? Oh, I, I'm up, I'm, uh, so in um, another slide, which I didn't bring here, I actually uh, introduced a whole bunch of other financial principles, like uh, I mentioned impairment. impairment. Makes okay. perfect sense. Uh, I actually specifically left out return on investment. Agreed. Uh, because I... Agreed. That, that's the forecasting piece. But I, I, I had it in, I took it out because I'm like, ugh. I w but return yeah, on investment anyway. is not just a forecast. There's so many other parts of the forecast. The forecast is um, license entitlements. We expected mm. that our company would grow by 500 employees this year. So when we renegotiated our Microsoft E5, we did it to 300 new entitlements, knowing that we would pay the bigger fee for the final, when they do the true up, right? So forecast also of what we expect to see occur. And when we see anomalous behavior once a month, we should look at, these are the things we expected, seasonality. Oh, this makes sense because it was August, those things don't occur. Yeah. These more of them. Uh, I, um, so well, we can take the rest offline, but uh, not all the, I, I would love to have every, as many principles apply but there were some I still struggled with to figure out what the right pattern match is. Um, but I found enough patterns that, like, ah, there's something really here that we can that we can latch onto. So. Connected in, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and we had a question here. Yeah, one more. Yeah, going back to your your thoughts on uh, due diligence and rigor. Mm -hmm. um, in cyber, most of the time we think about um, uh, materiality as a purely financial construct or reputational only if it has a reasonable impact on that same financial situation. Have you given any thought to whether there's an alternate way of thinking about materiality in this context using these principles? Um, great, really great question for which uh, we as a community are struggling to find the answer. Um, uh, Yael is familiar with this, but I asked, I specifically asked this question to a whole bunch of CISOs, and uh, beyond the, you know, whatever uh, FCFO says in terms of monetary, like uh, materiality of 20% of revenue, whatever, whatever, okay, I'm like, yeah, I, I get that. Uh, let's, let's take that one off the table. How else would you define materiality? And it was, we, we don't have a good answer. We don't have an answer at all. We absolutely need to have an answer. Well, uh, the answer, uh, uh, to some degree, is this notion of variance, OK? Uh, is the variance material enough that, it's rep that the public needs to know about it? And, and this notion of variance, uh, we, of course, the, the, on the finance side, it's numbers, money, right? But I also mentioned this notion of variance in this context. Like, how, how variant is, my, is ledger one from ledger two? Tom? Okay, uh, you want to just yell it anyway? Are we out of time? Uh, from zero one after this? Yeah. Right after? Uh, yeah. That should be it. Go ahead, noon. Noon. That's like 10 minutes. So, 10 minutes. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Have any questions if you want to pull the speaker aside, but we do have uh, another presentation after this. So, thank you for coming out. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it.